Indigenous Earth Community Podcast, where we celebrate Indigenous heroes from around the world and learn from them on how to honor the traditions of protecting the planet. We discuss actionable tips on how to connect to our beautiful planet while lessening our daily impact. I'm your host, Frank Oscar Weaver. Welcome, friends, to season two of the Indigenous Earth Community Podcast. I am so excited to start a new season with an amazing interview with Alex Ibarra from Indigenous Bee Rescue, all the way from Australia. Alex shares his incredible work of saving bee colonies and how he honors the traditions of the original inhabitants of Australia with his work. We chat about so many fascinating topics, ranging from the relationship of the people of Australia for thousands of years with the ecosystem all around them, and the importance of education for culture keeping. And of course, we talk about a lot about bees, beekeeping, honey, and how we can help our pollinator friends. I think you're going to love this episode. Enjoy. Hello, Alex Ibarra. Thank you so much for being on the podcast. Sure. Thank you very much for having um, your podcast. Fantastic. Before we start, I was wondering, do you have some words of wisdom or a short prayer or meditation you'd like to share with us so we can ground our conversation? Uh, I'd love to share with you um, something about uh, just acknowledging the elders. So um, here um, with our Indigenous people, we, we love to, to um, acknowledge where, where our feet are planted and, and acknowledge the fact of where we are grounded. Um, before we start any meetings or conversations and things like that, uh, it's a good way to sort of um, understand where you come from and, and where your place is in the world. Uh, so I just like to acknowledge the elders past, present and into the future uh, and that, you know, our conversations, that our work, that our efforts um, all lead to the betterment of our communities uh, across the world uh, for Indigenous people and non-Indigenous people to uh, reach true reconciliation and, and work together to to provide fantastic opportunities into the future. Yeah, that's beautiful. Those are really beautiful words. And uh, I really appreciate, you know, you having that in mind. And I know that you're in Australia right now. Uh, you know, what region are you at and what does it look like? Yeah, so I'd like to, um, here, I'm here on Yagara country, which is uh, in Brisbane. Uh, so it's uh, where I actually live myself, my house is a place called Kagama Bill, and that's the resting place of the echidna. Uh, and so that's the, the area totem for this for this piece of um, this suburb, I suppose you would call it. Um, but it's a bit bit broader than that. Um, but yeah, so that that's where where I live, and it's kind of uh, it's a we have a large river that comes through Brisbane, uh, where our city is situated. Uh, the that land is called Mianjin, and it means the hip bone. And that's because from an aerial view, if you have a look at the river, it sort of meanders through, and that area where the, the um, our CBD sits actually is a, a meeting spot and that meeting spot was called um, Mianjin which means the hip bone of that area so that's sort of and that's what it looks like um, as a river cuts through it kind of looks like the hip bone there so that's sort of uh, where where I live and it's quite um, subtropical so we get steady rain for lots of rain uh, during the except the last couple of years has been quite dry um, but we get we often go through drought cycles um, and you know flood cycles uh, things like that fire uh, affected us last summer quite quite drastically across the whole country um, and so that's led to um, you know a, a change in landscape and, and now also a flourishing of new life that's coming from, from after those fires as well in some of those areas yeah I mean the Australian fires were all over the news. And it was, you know, crazy how widespread they were. And I know here in Florida, the fires were a part of the ecosystem. You know, uh, we will be a fire every year with the thunderstorms. And you can see the, the growth that will come uh, right away, you know, within like weeks of a fire. That region that you are in right now, is that, uh, is fire part of the ecosystem or is that kind of like... Uh, it was just like a um, rare thing to happen. Yeah, absolutely. No, no. Um, fire has been, is, is an essential part of our ecosystem. So all of our, well, the majority of our landscape is full of rich, um, you know, uh, saps and oils and very oily um, uh, landscape, you know, trees. So uh, it's highly combustible, especially during a, a heat wave summer. 
uh, the you, needs very very little to actually set um, you know the landscape on fire, and that is mainly because of the relationship between Indigenous peoples here and the landscape itself. Um, that for so long, um, you know, peer-reviewed articles have it as far as uh, eighty to ninety thousand years, but unpeer-reviewed articles that they're looking at the moment have it as far as one hundred and eighty thousand years uh, that Indigenous people have been here. Um, uh, making it the oldest active, um, you know, continuous civilization in the history of the planet at this stage. Um, and so it's sort of you look at the relationship between the land and the people and you have a direct correlation between the relationships. So the difference between what you would get in most uh, systems around the world with, with um, you know, uh, perhaps in Western ways of looking at ecosystems it's that Indigenous people here in Australia have been able to integrate themselves and slot themselves within the actual natural ecosystem. So using, um, you know, landscape uh, uh, signifiers to be able to actively make decisions around what, what to do and what, what actions to make for the future. So that ensures that you have a symbiotic relationship with the country that you're living on. It means that your connection with that country is so much greater because you are actively living amongst it. Uh, you don't look at the landscape as something that you can change and that, well, you do, you look at it, you can change, but you look at it for how you can change to benefit, not just yourself, um, if if that sort of makes a bit more sense. It's so the, the landscape here needs fire in order to have rebirth um, because of the way that we've interacted with it um, continually for, for such a long period of time. So, I mean, within Digibee, we, we also work, I mean, we, we look at, yeah, we save bees, but, you know, to 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 save bees, you also need to save country. You need to look after the surrounds and lands that, 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 that they appear in, they live in, they thrive in. So we we actively work with our communities and with, uh, you know, fire specialists and management and, and, and ecological managers so, so and scientists so that we know that we are getting the best delivery and best outcomes through through a, a Western framework of looking at it as well as through an Indigenous uh, um, perspective of looking at the complex sciences around it. So it's not just um, being able to look at the land and, and, and set fire to it, but understanding what that fire is going to impact. There's different types of fire. There's not just one type of fire. Um, and so just as much as there's different kinds of smokes. And so you have to be able to, to, to read the land and understand exactly what you're setting fire to, the right conditions, right animals are in the right places, and you're doing it in the right sequence so that you don't disrupt the actual ecosystem and that it plays more of an important role in regeneration. Uh, and, and that is the difference between an Indigenous way of looking at agriculture and a non-Indigenous looking at, at agriculture with cloud fields, for example. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's so much beautiful words that you're speaking and so complex. And, you know, to think about, you know, the Aboriginal tradition, you know, spanning like thousands of years, you know, here in the United States, you know, we look at a building that is 100 years old and we're like, wow, that's a really old building, you know, or even like our way of uh, governing democracy is just 100 years old. Uh, and you have people that are living within the land and in harmony for thousands and thousands of years. So there's a lot of knowledge there. And I appreciate, you know, you're putting that into the forefront in your mind. And you kind of spoke a little bit about the uh, Native Bee Rescue. Uh, How did you get started with that? And what does that entail? Yeah, absolutely. So with the, the Native Bee Rescue, we sort of, so Indigibee sits within the larger framework of the company. Um, and we look we look at things um, from, to develop Indigenous self-economic determination um, in terms of what we're, you know, be able to do modelling and be able to create something that's uh, regenerative instead instead of being uh, something that is just a consumerist uh, approach. Um, and we initially looked at um, setting up into the native B sort of, you know, we, we understand the links with culture, but um, we, we looked at it from more of a commercial perspective. And um, we looked at the existing, because here in Australia, it's a burgeoning industry. It's only been seriously looked at for the last 20 years as something that's a, a viable. Before that, it was largely dismissed um, and something that's, you know, was there. But um, for Indigenous peoples, it's extremely, extremely important um, aspect of culture and it's a highly tradable item. Um, it's, it plays an important part in not only spiritually um, and also in, in medicine, um, things like that, but it, um, it's um, an important part of the ecosystem and relationship as well. So 
uh, we were looking at this this as terms of what were the sort of commercial viability aspects of it for Indigenous um, business um, and really came to a decision after looking at the industry and looking how it was sort of starting to emerge um, that really there needed to be an Indigenous voice uh, within the industry itself, uh, not necessarily not necessarily to... to um, make large profits and things like that, but mainly to bring an aspect of uh, connection to that country and, and respect for the for the country and for the, for the things that we we use, not not so exploitive. Um, so really, I think we found ourselves unintentionally, but the obligation is always there as as people of indigenous heritage um, that you um, that you do your you do your best as as custodian as a steward of the land. So we ended up um, more of a industry disruptor than as a um, there's a rather than a contributor. Um, so we provide all of our services for free um, because we've we've found in our experience that, that poaching and and the uh, the underhand uh, side of um, animal, you know, pet trades and things like that uh, is really at the forefront and is really a, a, a hard driving force behind a lot of the motivation of why uh, a lot of these bees are rescued. So we find ourselves in the point where we've, we deliver for, for free what others will, will charge or pay for um, in the in the hopes of trying to to um, uh, educate and re-educate and, and just, you know, and, and say, more from the perspective of look after country and country will look after you. Uh, there's no reason that we have to, you know, put these bees in the same exploitive position that we put many of our other native animals here. You can go back as far as the, the, the 1800s here and locally in Brisbane here, just up the road, there was a, a, a guy who would collect guanas and then would skin them and drain them down to make guana oil, which is absolutely amazing medicinal properties for your skin and all sorts of things, right? And it was a wonder, it was a wonder, a wonder miracle sort of um, <laughs> potent, that would, potent that would go around the uh, go around the world, right? Um, but the number of goannas that had to be slaughtered in order to make that um, was at a commercial scale. Uh, so the, the sustainability of that was, was questionable. Um, and obviously laws change and things like that and those practices stop. But there's you look at the, the nature and the uniqueness of the animals and the, the, the relationship that they have here in Australia, um, we can't really be messing with that too much. We already um, mess with them with introduced species, things like honeybees are introduced here, um, toads, foxes, rabbits. Um, you know, we've got a whole range, you know, even dogs and cats um, have a really massive uh, impact on our ecosystems, even local in ecosystems in um, residential areas. So, and here in Australia, we actually log more area of, of um, trees, of, of rural area, of, um, than any other Western country in the world at, at this point. So we're, we're logging hard out, we're, we're, we're demolishing football fields. Um, in our efforts to build more houses and to build more mines and to build more resources because that means more profits for the pocket. For the pocket. But really, that ultimately means more damage for country. And there needs to be a balance between making a profit and looking after our future. Yeah, and I think it really comes to keeping the, the traditions of the ancestors and respecting and that's why you bring that approach of sustainability and you get called to do a bee rescue and you go there, you pick a hive from one place and you guys take it somewhere safe. And when you get that call, do you have a preference of which kind of bees is going to be there? Like, do you think like, oh, I hope is this not this kind of bee or, or is this kind of bee? Like, do you have a preference? Um, not really, to be honest. Uh, we, we, we go out to every bee rescue because we know that there, uh, we have techniques and abilities to be able to revive really damaged, very, very, very damaged hives. We can, we still have techniques to be able to pull them back um, to make them strong. Um, you use incubators, things like that. So, but because of the the, the um, complexities around the pet trade here and the way the demand, the supply and demand, sort of the demand is way outstripping the supply. So therefore, the price of bees are actually increasing. So um, the the ability to we go out to rescue as many bees as we possibly can. So even if it's a honeybee, uh, you know, ones that are going to sting you nice and proper, we don't we don't um, 
actually deal within ourselves. We have partners that we work with that, you know, we get, oh, we've got APIS B hive here. So we work with APIS B keepers um, to be able to ensure that they're still rescued. Um, and so, and that still comes at no cost to the client as well, unless it's something very technical and, and needs, you know, heavy equipment or something. Yeah, for sure. And I grew up in Paraguay in a very uh, rural area, um, very farmlands, and we live like in the edge of the forest. In our house, uh, the front pillar was like a tree trunk, and there was a colony of bees that lived there. Uh, we call it Jatai bees, and the scientific name is Tetragonisca angustula, and... Um, a lot of the indigenous people come to visit us and they always told us there was good luck to have a hive in our house. And some other people will come, no, you have to harvest the, the honey because it tastes really good. But we never did it because, you know, it was considered good luck. But we always knew that the weather was going to change when they closed their uh, entrance. You could see them like coming in and they will close their entrance. And I'll tell people, hey, there's a rainstorm coming. And they're like, how do you know? And I was like, the bees told me, right? Um, yeah. We we can learn so much from from nature. Um, is there other lessons that you have learned from like observing the bees? Oh, absolutely. There's oh, there's so many lessons to be to be learned from observing nature, just in general. Um, and you're right. For indigenous peoples, it's it's an observational science that goes into everything. And for indigenous people here. Thousands of years of observation have gone into these um, these outcomes at the end. Um, and so from the bees themselves, you find uh, many great lessons in terms of how they're adaptable, like how they're so adaptable. They take the shape of water. It doesn't matter what the, sh the, the shape of the container or the space or the hollow or wherever they've made themselves a home, they'll they'll adapt to that, to that situation. Um, shows you how tenacious that nature is, really, um, even in the way that the unique way. Like here we have an Australis, uh, um, Australis species that, that closes its front up as well and builds like a little web out of, um, and there's a few other species up north that also build little webs across their entrances as well. Yeah. And that's a, at, at, at night, so usually at night to keep pests out. So in, in, in the morning, they, they bring them down in the morning. So um, it's great to, to see those sort of things. but also with here are the seasonal indicators that come with it so it's a season so here um yes the, the honey is the sugar bag is very uh is very medicinally potent but it's only potent when the right right seasonal indicators are out uh, so when the right plants are going into blossom uh, you know is the right time to harvest so from a traditional um you know i guess beekeeping um point of view you have here is the the continual um, understanding of the seasonal indicators and how that relationship equates with the, with the bees themselves. So when to harvest honey, when not to harvest honey, uh, also when to, to go and take a hive, if you want to take a hive and eat brood and things like that, because you know that they're going to be going to swarm and lots of hives are going to be getting created everywhere. So uh, you can choose one or two that you can actually cut out and, and eat and use the wax and things like that to, as a, as a, trading item or for your artifacts. So it's about understanding that relationship it gives you a much better understanding of uh, how you can manipulate um, the, be the bees in that relationship um, uh, for, for the betterment of, of, of both or for the betterment of yourself uh, in terms of being able to use something as medicine. Uh, because all parts of beehive is considered food except for the bees themselves. So the brood, uh, all of the propolis that the structure is built has uh, out of is all, all edible, you know, the wax, um, all of the, the honey and the pollen, everything that's contained inside. There's not many um, plants that are really sweet or there's not very many sweet things that we don't, you know, sugar canes introduced into Australia. So these things have to be... Uh, considered very they're considered very special so things like your wattles and your grevilleas and that you can put in a little bit of water and wash them out and make a sweet drink um and that they're the very few few sweet high sugar sources you're going to find in the australian landscape honey ants things like that so they're all um hard work but high output um <clears throat> so hard work to get them because it's hard it's hard work to actually go and track a, a beehive and and go and, and find and cut it out and all the rest of it and do it properly um and up north you know there's evidence of 
continual relationship with, with bees uh, as they have scar trees that you can see the bee movement up and down the trees with the, with the, the um, cuts on the tree as well. And, you know, we work with communities and we work with, with our, our, our partners that help support us to make sure that this understanding and this, um, this way of pushing ideas forward uh, is, is to show all of Australia's, you know, every country is individual within Australia. Indigenous people are not homogenised. They're not all one people. Everybody has unique outputs and, and, and unique perspectives and unique stories uh, that can be all linked and, and intertwined uh, with, the same, with the same output. Um, so our goals are all common at the end of the day, but, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a different front that each of us are on um, and our purposes are all the same, though. Yeah, for sure. And that kind of brings me to the point that uh, I saw you guys having education being a really big part of the work you do, like going to school, talking to students. And uh, why why you think that is uh, the next key is to teach people about the work you do? Um, so I'm actually a teacher by profession. So I work in the classroom. Uh so I, I love education and I love the fact that young people learn so much and are so dynamic and are able to change the ways that, you know, have fresh eyes, so to speak. Uh, and for Indigenous peoples, it's also an important part of culture, you know, that, that continuation of knowledge, that passing down of knowledge to, to your, your, the next generation to ensure that as a continuation of knowledge that, that passes. Um, to and for, and it's reciprocal knowledge too. It's not just one way; it's two way. We learn as much from our children as they learn from us as well. Uh, so it has to be reciprocal in that nature as well. So, uh, in terms of when it comes to education, I think it's our obligation to make sure that the next generation have as much ammunition in their armament of knowledge to be able to to find dynamic solutions to the complex problems that are coming. Um, we might not have the solutions right now, but we might be able to give them parts and and pieces that they can put together to make a far more uh, uh, resolute uh, solution to in the future. Yeah, for sure. Um, I always tell pessimistic people, you're pessimistic because you're not around kids. Because if you're around kids, you see how much energy and positive and great things are coming, you know. And uh, Alex, I'm going to have you a hard question for you. So I'm going to give you some time to think. Yeah. But uh, what's your favorite type of honey? Okay, I know it's a hard kind of question, so I'm going to let you think. Um, mine is black mangrove. Uh, there's a secret spot here in Florida where they harvest the honey out of the mangroves. And last year I went there with my wife and there was um, dolphins swimming around the area. There was manatees, there was bees, and we harvest the honey from the, uh, the black mangroves. And it's, it's unbelievable. It's like sweet. And it's salty at the same time. It's, it's really, really good. I- that's amazing. I've never had anything that amazing, I don't think, <laughs> mate. That's, that sounds incredible. <laughs> yeah. Um, no, uh, the, probably the... Um, um, favorite honey, that's, a, that's a difficult question. Yeah. Um, you have to be maybe some of the... Uh, well, I think what's so brilliant about it is when you do bee rescues and stuff like that, the honey that you get or the, the sugar bag is not necessarily honey. It's like a plant nectar that not processed. Um, it's so unique because of the plants that are around. Uh, so every time you, you taste some, it's, it's slightly different. Sometimes it might be more lemony or sometimes it might taste like passion fruit. There's passion fruit nearby or something like that. And you're like, wow, wow, that's amazing. Um, so I'm always... I can never really compare because I find them so unique. Uh, sometimes they're a bit tangy if they got a bit of pollen in it or something like that. Um, but I would have to say, uh, even sugar ants were pretty pretty delicious as well. So I don't know if that counts as honey. <laughs> I had ants uh, when I was a little kid, um, and but they were like almost like with salt, so they were like peanuts. But I never had the sugar ants. Oh, Oh, delicious. Oh, well, here um, you can have uh, things like witchetty grubs. Uh, they're, they're a pretty well known uh, insect that you can eat here. Um, and that you can cook them up and they have sort of like a creamy, nutty sort of aftertaste. Um, I suppose that'd be close to nuts yeah. <laughs> in, in that one. Um, but then also, 
yeah, uh, for here in, ter- in terms of edible insects, for Indigenous people, all of the insects are edible as well. So all of your ant larvae, um, they're, they're, they're also very sweet. They're a bit sugary. Um, so I, I often get them in the tops of the beehives. Like sometimes when you go in to inspect them, you'll have like ants that are going up there and you can just get a teaspoon, knock off some ants and then eat some <laughs> of the larvae. It's actually quite sugary. Quite sweet. It's, not too, it's not too bad. And, and it's, you know, so you're harvesting too, yeah. right? Bees and ants, <laughs> mate. <laughs> that is awesome. Um, yeah, but then also um, here you have things like moths uh, that are also edible. So the ecosystem is very, very specific in its relationships between all of them. And, you know, those those moth, bogon moths are, you know, a massive moth and you can harvest them with a net, um, grind them down into a paste uh, and then turn that into a food source. Yeah, it's incredible. Um, all the ways that we can, you know, get food from, from nature. And I'm really into like rock art and, you know, Australia is like the Mecca when it comes to rock art. And I know in Australia, there's some rock arts that is made with like big wax. Um, do you know about that? Or have you uh, visited sites where they have rock art around Australia? Yeah, yeah absolutely. Absolutely. Um, so the, the rock art itself, again, is very unique to each nation. Um, so every nation has a different, a distinct sort of uh, style of painting as such. Um, and so you can even identify where artifacts and things are from by the style of how it's painted. Uh, so where, where um, my ancestors are from, from Bidjara Nation, out eight hours west of um, Brisbane, they often use x-ray art and lots of um, cross-hatching to, to in, in, their, in their art. Um, but then there's also areas around the, around the country. Some of our most famous is probably like the dot art, uh, the, the dot art sort of um, indigenous artwork that goes around. Um, that's that's probably some of our like that only comes from one nation in Australia though. There's one specific spot, uh, desert peoples, um, and so there's lots of different varieties of of art that you can find in Australia. There's not just when you see rock art, it's not just, oh, yeah, I've seen that before. They're all super unique and they are so, all of them are so special. Um, unfortunately, though, here, uh, that appreciation doesn't always come across um, with the rock art here. And um, I suppose in general with just the um, the Indigenous perspectives here, some of the battles in terms of working with um, communities in those spaces, um, there's a lot of appropriation um, of indigenous artwork, um, as well as um, destruction of those sites that you're talking about. So only a couple of weeks ago, we had a mining company here um, destroy uh, an ancient um, cave that had, you know, some some highly highly significant cultural sacred spots. Um, but you know, iron ore is too valuable. So um, <laughs> so that's that's sort of how you. How, how some of those difficulties with appreciating the uniqueness of these um, rock art sites. Um, some of them are positioned extremely precariously close to some um, of other human activity that is uh, threatening their survival. And those rock arts, you know, as the variety of they are, I always sort of compare them to the blackboard in the classroom. You know, it's kind of like you're walking into a classroom where the blackboard is still actively being used and you know you might not necessarily understand everything that's going on there but if you to a person who does understand that's information that's crucial teachings um and so it's important that we we understand and respect those those sacred rock art sites and with the in regards when you were talking about with the beeswax um here we a lot of the artwork is formed out of natural uh, pigments and dyes. Uh, so ochre is is the type of mineral that's used the most, and that's ground down into a into a fine dust. Um, there's yellow, there's black, there's red, there's um, all sorts of different colours, and, and they're very earthy. Um, now, if you melt down the beeswax, the propolis, and you mix it with ochre, it gives you a, a, a essentially an oil based paint. So Indigenous people of Australia were already creating oil based paint thousands and thousands of years ago <laughs> um, yeah. um, and, 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 um, and doing, you know, their own Mona Lisa's on the, uh, on the cave walls. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's awesome. And it's kind of interesting that you mentioned in that, you know, the rock art is almost like a chalkboard because, you know, when we went to visit the, a lot of the rock art sites and, you know, we're, we're looking and 
And in Paraguay, you know, back then when I was growing up, rock art was not very well known. And each group of people, they would always try to interpret different ways, but they never asked the indigenous people what it meant. Right. But because they're like, oh, this is where like giants, because they were so tall and they could um, write on the walls or they were like uh, small people. That's why it was on the bottom. Right. But uh, one thing that I remember was that a teacher came and said, like, no, like the when you're going to write something, you always do it at eye level. So it's not like we had people at different heights. It's just that the floor changed with which with time. So that kind of remembers when you're talking about uh, a chalkboard. And when you look at those symbols, it's, it's, it's like an emotion that you feel like like no other to to see those thoughts and those images. Uh, I highly recommend it for people to, to check it out uh, while being respectful, of course. And uh, one day I want to go to Australia and kind of check it out, out the, uh, the rock art uh, you have there. And we know, Alex, we talk a lot about, you know, all the great things that the bees and um, they do for us, what we can learn. But I know that the population of pollinators and bees are declining throughout the world. Why is that? Yeah, so um, that is a global problem that we need to look at as as a human society. And that is the position that we've put our environments in. Uh, essentially here in Australia, our agricultural systems are exhausting the land. They're not regenerative. So we're taking away from the land. There are farmers and there are people who are being, uh, who are modernizing their farms and going back to traditional practices, even, um, incorporating indigenous agriculture on their own properties in order to sustain them and increase their, their, um, yields. But the fact is that there are, the majority of agricultural systems are so reliant on pesticides and um, defoliators and things like that for weeds, and, and they have a very highly negative effect on the pollinators that rely on them. It also puts things out of balance in the ecosystem because when you lose a whole section of, say, predators... So I, I also... Here with, with beekeepers in Australia, I, I have this conversation. Uh, I take exception exception to it sometimes when people are the native bees have a have a pest. They have you know a variety of pests and, and native pests that that are a problem to them that can collapse hives and kill them, so forth. Uh, so these uh, there are many keepers that kill the pests and they kill the pests, the parasitic wasps and and whatever else and flies and um. The problem is, though, is that you can put things out of balance by interfering too much. So we decentralise all of our hives. We don't have one spot where we have all of our hives at once. Um, you know, we try to maintain as much. If there's an area that's being developed and turned into a new housing estate, we'll try and put some hives in there somewhere um, to ensure that all of those trees that were cut down to make those those um, houses, there may have probably been a number of hives in there. So we'll go and sometimes even sneakily just go and put a beehive in there somewhere. Um, and so the, the, the decentralization nature of looking at our impact with the environment is a massive um, issue, especially when it comes to commercial, commercial scale agricultural systems, because commercially they're looking at high yields. They're looking at the yield and the price per kilo or for you guys pound or, you know, yeah. <laughs> um, so so we've got um, we've got this this uh, this alternating and this uh, clash of ideals and, and clash of wants um, by corporations and by what the actual land needs and wants, uh, and so we become reliant in us in the system, the cycle of fertilizers and pesticides to to ensure that the land keeps giving. Um, but the problem of that is that we're losing the other pollinators that actually keep balance to our systems. We're losing the balance that comes with that. Here in Australia, we're having massive issues with drought. Our land is not drought resilient anymore. It hasn't got it hasn't got the capacity to be able to withstand these long term droughts, which are getting longer and longer and longer. You know, our barrier reef is bleaching because the waters are getting warmer and warmer, and we've got more pesticides and more chemicals flowing into the ocean uh, in our rain runoff when it does rain. Um, you know, the land blows away in the winds when the, when it's dry as anything and leaves leaves bare cracked ground and then it, next season it, it, it 
burns and then floods. So we lose all of that nutrition that was even there before. Um, so it's a, it's a chaotic cycle that we're going into now because of our inability to see the issues that we're causing uh, wide scale. And it's a global problem. It's not just here in Australia. These are just the examples I can give you. But it's more, uh, you know, I'm sure the same thing's happening in the United States. I'm sure the same thing's happening in the South America nations. Same thing's happening in Africa, uh, even Europe. You know, I've talked to people in Europe who are looking at changing their, they're going back to fire practices because they realise that Indigenous peoples of Europe were using fire and they're looking at regenerating their land because, you you know, Groups in France getting their farms together and setting fire to it to try and to try and bring back old traditions because they know what they're doing is not working. Yeah, it's our world is, is going crazy and it feels like as humanity we're not able to to look beyond um, our little corner to where we live and stop and pay attention to the people that have been here since the beginning and what they've been doing. And if we are able to do that, then maybe we can like learn and create a world with more harmony that is going to be able to feed everybody, but also take care of everybody. And, uh, you know, without what that we said is, is there something that people can do at home to help the bees or to be more sustainable? Yeah, absolutely. First, first and foremost is stop using pesticides. Um, so if you stop using pesticides, that's your first step to success. Um, get rid of the, you know, the little spray bottles of your, um, plant killers and whatever else and, and put them aside, put away the more teen and, and maybe just get a little bit more friendly. We're seeing some more spiders in the garden and things like that. Uh, if you have a lawn, lawns, uh, lawns are the es essentially the equivalent of a desert landscape for pollinators. Um, so if you have a lawn, turn, let that thing go to weed. You know, weeds for us, it looks ugly for us, but it's actually a beautiful thing for pollinators. It's a beautiful thing for the insects and for balance around us. So if, even if you live in a small city area and you get this tiny little, you know, backyard or courtyard, even you think, oh, I can't really do much for, for I can't really have a big garden here or anything like that. It's the small things. Just if you've got a small patch of grass, let it go to, let it go to flower and let you know maybe even rip it up and put some actual native grasses down or something like that replace it with even if it's the smallest little section we can rebuild our country backyard by back backyard our countries all around the world that have been affected by human activity you can rebuild sustainably through that you know i was talking to a, a, a another guy we, we um colleague and we um we were saying how good would it be if when you looked on google maps you could barely see the uh the cities because it's so green you know everyone's got rooftop gardens everyone's got you know so it's it's that relationship that we have with the environment around us we are not an external factor we are an animal just as much and just as much have a role in us in our environment and ecosystem so our impacts are massive so we just got to make sure what our impacts are so things little things like recycling you know don't don't throw you know, the cigarette butt out the window or something like that, you know, don't let that, if you see a piece of paper going across the street, pick it up, put it in the bin. Um, just the little tiny things will make a big difference first. Um, Cause I know that in like South America, there's studies that have come out that show that native bees down there were using the plastics and the microplastics to build their hives, um, which could have consequences into the future. Who knows? Um, so, but we know that the animals are adapting to our behavior. So everything else is adapting to our behavior, plants, animals, insects, you know, um, but whether it's good adaptation or whether it's a bad adaptation uh, seems to be yet to determine. Um, but it doesn't, it looks like things are more out of balance than they are in balance uh, in, in a lot of instances. So I think that if we just sort of maintain those, we each personally do that little, that little bit more, um, I think it plays to the greater role and also our consumer education. We need to be educated in what we are buying. We need to be educated in what our consumer uh, practices actually impact. For you know, we our societies looked at child slavery and things like that because of you know where our shirts and things were made from, and that changed business practices around the world. We need to look at the other practices that we do to impact the way that businesses operate. Also, you know, we want to try and model these ways of being. It doesn't. For a regenerative sort of way and outlook at it, it doesn't have to be come at the cost of financial expense. You know, there has to be you know financial, e economical reliability and 
And um, then also needs to be that social responsibility as a business and then also that environmental responsibility. And if we take that on into our personal lives, um, you know, this, this, the responsibilities of that, we're doing stewardship of our own little corner of the world. We can't change the whole world ourselves. We can only change our corner. Yeah. And I, I like the image you gave us about, you know, using Google Maps and looking around and just seeing like all green. How beautiful would that be? Right. And uh, you're right. I mean, we have to start on our, on our backyards. It's very easy to say that the problem is across the street and we don't look at ourselves. And uh, I want to thank you very much for coming to the podcast, telling about the bees and uh, the traditions in Australia. And uh, once we harvest the um, the the honey from the black uh, mangroves, I'm going to send you some uh, for you to try because you're going to love it. Uh, thank you so much, Alex, for being on it. Thank you so much for having me. I absolutely really enjoyed this and um, fantastic. Hope to talk to you again soon. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.